Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, wonderful to be here. And uh, I would like to thank TEDx and MS uh, Bangalore for choosing this topic outside out, which is, I think, very applicable to both my life and to persons with disabilities, especially in India. Uh, for outside, because we are often outside the ecosystem and ignored by society, governments, and the world at large. And out, because we need to think out of the box to show our presence. And I think that's really been the story of both my life and the disability movement in India. Uh, so the theme that I'm going to speak about is disability, my life, and the three years. I've divided the talk into two parts. The first is where I'm going to speak about myself to set the context. And the second is about the three years framework that I've developed, to, uh, which I really think can solve a lot of problems that persons with disabilities in India face. But uh, more on that later. I was uh, born on 1st September 1987. Uh, it was 8.30 a.m. in the morning when my mom went to a hospital in Mumbai for a cesarean surgery. Uh, she had chosen 1st September strategically because uh, she knew she had to get, do a cesarean delivery. So, and 1st uh, September happened to be Ganesh Chaturthi in that particular year. And she was a very religious person. And as all of you know, uh, Lord Ganesha is considered the remover of obstacles. So I'm sure she went, uh, went in with a lot of hope that uh, her first child will remove a lot of obstacles in her life and give her a lot of joy and happiness. But uh, when I was born and when I was taken out of my mother's womb, I was uh, bleeding, my arms and legs were fractured, and doctors did not really know what to do with me. And uh, one doctor actually shouted, oh no. And that's when my mom realized there's something wrong, and she started inquiring wh what's happened. And doctors did not really want to share that news immediately with her because that would be extremely traumatizing. And I was immediately taken to a baby incubator and wrapped in the blanket. And as I often say, you know, that the baby incubator is the only place where if you're wrapped in the blanket and not naked, there's something wrong with you. Uh, eventually, my parents realized there was something wrong with me, and a lot of doctors were invited to give a diagnosis. Uh, I was born with this disability called arthrogryphosis, which basically means that the muscles in my arms and legs were not fully developed, and they would not develop throughout my lifetime. Unfortunately, at that time, doctors were not really sensitive on how to react with a child, to a child with a disability. There were some doctors who actually told my, told my parents that uh, perhaps it's worth keeping him alive because his neck is straight, but we don't really know what else can he do in life. There was another doctor that who actually told my parents that uh, Nippon is going to live the life equivalent of a wooden doll, and that's why I write here the story of a wooden doll. Uh, but what was the turning point in my life, really, was this one doctor who told my mother, that Nippon is never really going to deprive you of the joys of motherhood. And I think that really was the turning point in my life. Uh, since then, it became my parents' mission in li life to judge me for what I can do and not what I cannot do. And they decided to fight against society to give me a completely normal life. My first few years were filled with operations, injections, and various tough decisions that my parents had to take. And by the time I was around four years old, it was finally time to send me to a normal school. And there were a wide variety of people who told my parents that perhaps Nippon should go to a special school for the disabled and not really to a normal school because he is not normal. But what my parents told everybody at that time, and I think that set the tone for the rest of my life, is that uh, of course he's normal. He just happens to have a disability. And we don't want to protect him by sending him to, uh, sending him to a special school because eventually he has to face the normal challenges in life. And uh, I'm lucky that they thought that way, and uh, I think that was the second best decision they took in their life. Perhaps the decision of marrying each other was the best decision. There were a wide variety of schools that rejected me. They, they went to around 20 schools that did not want to really give me admission. Before there was this one school that finally decided to enroll me and see me for my abilities and not my disabilities. I, my school had a very big theater, and I wanted to participate in plays. And every year, I used to land up for auditions. But uh, the theater teacher wasn't really sure how to really enroll me in a play. So the first year that I landed up, she said, no, unfortunately, we don't really have a role for you. You will have to go back. Uh, the second year I landed up again, she again had to send me back because she not really thought of something. But the third year when I landed up, she said, oh, wow, Nipun, thank you for coming. I've actually thought of a role for you. You're going to be on stage throughout the play more than the lead actor and more than the lead actress. I was, of course, thrilled. I went back home and told everybody that, I've got a great role. I'm going to be in my school annual production. The next day when I landed up, I realized that I was a tree on the set of the play because the teachers thought that if 
perhaps I'm very good at you know staying physically at one place. So why not? And uh, I really enjoyed that experience. And I think what that taught me is that in life you of course won't always get what is ideal, but I think you should make the most out of everything that you really can get. And I think that's about thinking outside out. After my school, I wanted to get into the best of institutions, but most government colleges in this country weren't really accessible. And I went to a private college for a year, which wasn't, which was accessible, but it wasn't the best of education institutions to study in. And I realized after a year that I'm studying on a scrap of paper and I decided to reapply to Delhi University. And I remember the St. Stephen's interview where the principal actually told me, Nipun, I love your CV, but the economics classroom has been on the first floor for around 125 years and we cannot shift it down for one person. I said, uh, no problem, I mean, I, I'll go up one floor every day. And for four days, I actually took two weightlifters with me and uh, climbed up one floor every day. And finally, uh, thanks to my persistence, the college shifted the economics classroom down. And they also thought out of the box where they could not make the first floor accessible, but they shifted the economics classroom down, which I think was great. And uh, I also became the founder of the enabling committee in St. Stephen's, through which uh, St. Stephen's became completely accessible during my time at college, and now St. Stephen's is one of the most accessible colleges in the country. Uh, apart from that, I made a lot of friends in St. Stephen's. I was the founder of the entrepreneurship cell, and uh, my life changed to a large extent when I was in St. Stephen's. But uh, I still remember when I was in my third year at St. Stephen's, I decided to apply for Delhi School of Economics for a master's in economics. And even though I was working hard for the entrance, I heard some people whispering that iska to physically challenge quota mein ho jayega, and I wanted to prove them wrong. And I locked myself into my room for uh, a couple of months and uh, slogged hard. And when the results came out, I had scored a 52nd rank nationwide and I'd actually defeated those friends of mine who were, were making those statements about me. So I think that was a proud moment for me. Though Delhi School of Economics still ended up becoming a major turning point in my life because when I was in Delhi School of Economics, I decided to sit for placements. And when I sat for placements, I saw the discrimination persons with disabilities face firsthand. There was this one company that rejected me because they wanted to see me uh, sit, uh, sit on my wheelchair for eight hours a day. They couldn't believe I could do that, and I refused to do that. There was a second that rejected me because they did not have a disabled-friendly toilet, and that after going through seven rounds of interviews with me. And when I said that, I, it's okay, I can control my bladder, they said, no, you might sue us tomorrow, so it's just safer not to hire you. And there was a third that actually asked me if I read a book in my life. Uh, these are just three anecdotes, of course. I'm not going to go into many other, many other uh, of the dozens of interviews that I applied for. But this, of course, was a real low point in my life. I did not want to know what to do in life. I almost started penning my obituary. But, uh, and I locked myself in my room for one month. I was under extreme depression. But it's then that I realized that uh, I've been very lucky where uh, my parents have given me so much, and I can use that to transform the life of other people with disabilities rather than just you know, give up at life. And that's when I started the Nippon Foundation. And instead of talking about really the initiatives that I have done in my foundation over the last six years, which I'm sure you, can, you all can anyway read online, and I will touch upon a bit through my framework, I decided to concentrate on the three A's as I call them, which are the main challenges that persons with disabilities face. And I think if these things are taken care of, persons with disabilities can have a much more empowered life, both in India and worldwide. Uh, the first one really is the, is, an, is the problem of attitudes. I think people with disabilities are not really treated as equal uh, by others around them in, in society. Pe we as people with disabilities do not really want sympathy, nor do we want to be treated uh, with ignorance, but we, we really want empathy and we want it to be treated as equals, just like you would treat anybody else. I mean, for, uh, for example, a couple of years back, I was actually denied entry by this particular restaurant because they said that as a policy, we don't allow people with disabilities inside. It was, of course, an extremely uh, shocking incident, a particularly humiliating experience. But uh, when I sent out a tweet about it, and that tweet went viral, I was shocked to hear the similar stories that a lot of people with disabilities face where they're not allowed to enter public spaces because people just don't want to be around them. Even when they say enter a restaurant, they're often not offered a menu. Uh, many families lock up their children with disabilities because there are social stigmas associated with them. Uh, there are many in India who actually believe that perhaps we've done a bad karma in our past life. That's why we have a disabled child in our life today. And just to give you a simple anecdote, uh, the World Health Organization says that 15% of the world's population is disabled. 
but as for the official census in india only around 2.21% of india's population is disabled i'm sure india is not a country of supermen where less disabled people are born it's just that india doesn't report its disabled population and that's a lot because of how people with disabilities are treated in their own families so i think equality really comes from home i was lucky that i was born to extremely liberal parents but uh, i saw discrimination first and too like that restaurant that i mentioned in my school life where i was not treated like an equal i've actually written a comic on that called no red card for the disabled a foundation has these annual awards last year microsoft was a partner where we recognize companies that employ people with disabilities you notice uh, this photo of the hajj on the slide here too and that's uh, because of a recent battle that i fought with the government of india where the government of india despite the fact that uh, the hajj committee internationally allows people with disabilities to go for the hajj the indian government was not allowing them to go for a hajj and i thought it was just an attitudinal barrier because hajj has been made accessible and me and other members of the disabled community actually had to fight with the government to ensure that people with disabilities can go for the hajj so these are daily battles that people with disabilities face and i think if the attitude battle can be won i think people with disabilities can be much more empowered both in india and the rest of the world uh, the second a that i'm really going to talk about is accessibility and again due to lack of time i'm not really going to go into detail about accessibility but i'm just going to try to explain what disability in my way, in my opinion really is uh, i believe in the social model of disability and the social model of the disability really says that disability is not really a medical problem as such but it's a social problem and the social problem basically means that disability exists due to the barriers that exist in society the barriers might be in terms of physical infrastructure they might be in terms of laws it might be in terms of policies and i think making physical infrastructure accessible is the first step towards making india an equal opportunity country and i'll give you a simple example just from this very room for that uh, i can come here and speak just like any other tedx speaker here on the stage because the organizers of tedx chose to build a ramp through which i could come on stage if this ramp didn't exist i would not have managed coming up on stage so this ramp actually makes me somebody who's just equivalent to any other tedx speaker who's on stage and i think that's really what i'm trying to talk about through accessibility and i think the next slide has vanished so i'm not sure if technology is very accessible here can somebody yeah thank you uh, so talking about accessibility some of the things that we've done at uh, a foundation are uh, we've helped make various events accessible like the jaipur literary festival the nh7 weekend or the serendipity arts festival and one of the main reasons why we focus so much on accessible events is because we feel that if people with disabilities can can come out and uh, celebrate in the open and people realize that people with disabilities do not just rely, need the physiological needs but uh, they complete uh, individual who can enjoy life too i think attitudes in society too will change apart from that we are ci as accessibility partner and we've uh, done a lot of access audits of a lot of private sector companies and uh, i guess i'm passionate about that because of the discrimination i faced first hand when i was in delhi school of economics another cool thing i did and this uh, and this particular thing that I, uh, that i did along with zomato was immediately after that particular restaurant that i had mentioned or you denied me entry today if you go on zomato you can actually see a wheelchair access filter that identifies which restaurants are accessible and this has really done two things firstly uh, you can identify of course physically which restaurants are accessible but secondly when restaurants are made to answer such questions they uh, change their attitudes towards disability too because it incentivizes them to become accessible and they of course won't deny entry to persons with disabilities other than that of course people with disabilities continue facing big challenges in terms of accessibility uh, last year itself i filed a pr against the delhi government because the delhi government decided to buy 2000 buses that are not accessible and it doesn't make sense why governments today would still continue to buy buses and invest in other infrastructure that is not accessible so that's a challenge that continues to exist uh due to lack of time i'm going to go to the next slide and talk about the last thing which is affordability uh two years around a year year and a half back we started this campaign called wheels for life that connects people who need wheelchairs to people who can donate wheelchairs because what i realize is that the cost of living with a disability especially in a country like india is so high because uh, firstly you need your your normal transport is not accessible so you need to make extra provisions you don't have easy access to attendants and caretakers uh, and something as simple as a wheelchair can really transform a life too and that's why i started this platform that connects anybody who needs wheelchair to somebody who anybody who can donate a wheelchair and it's called www.wheelsforlife.in i would urge all of you to go online on it and check it out 
And through Wheels for Life, over the last one year, we've impacted close to 800 lives, where through a simple wheelchair, there are people who manage going back to school, there are adults who manage taking up jobs and becoming economically self-sufficient. And a wheelchair costs us 5,000 rupees. I'm sure a lot of us just spend that amount of money on a meal at a five star or on perhaps a pair of jeans or on something that we like. But uh, something as simple as a disability aid can transform somebody's life. And when I was doing this, I was shocked to hear that the government, uh, on the other hand, when GST was introduced, started taxing disability aids. Uh, disability aids like hearing, uh, hearing aids, uh, various braille accessories, wheelchairs, etc. And uh, I do think that a GST on such disability aids is uh, really a tax on somebody walking, seeing, or this thing. And I decided to file a PIL against the government on this. That case is uh, still going on in court. But uh, these are just two examples, and these are two examples on the slide because I'm personally involved in them. But uh, affordability is a major challenge for persons with disabilities in India. And uh, I just mentioned two other things in terms of attendance and uh, transportation. Uh, but you can see that everywhere, because physical infrastructure itself is not accessible. So you have fewer options. For example, when I travel out of town, I actually need to, I mean, I'm sure a lot of my friends would look at pricing of hotels first and choose whatever's the most affordable. But for me, that does not even become a factor that gets into consideration, because I need to look at which uh, hotel is accessible. When I go to a movie hall, I need to look at which seat is accessible. It might not, and it might be the most expensive seat, but I don't really have a choice. And those are the challenges we as persons with disabilities often face. So I think if you, if you can solve the problems on attitudes, accessibility, and affordability, India will become a much more equal opportunity country, and people with disabilities will move from outside out to inside in. Thank you.